Good morning. Happy New Year. <laughs> you ever been involved in something or maybe doing some kind of work or task and you said to yourself, man, I can't wait until I'm done with this or I can't wait until this is over. Some of you might be in a marriage like that right now. That wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't as funny as I thought it might be to some of you. The thing that I, I think I struggle with more maybe than anything else in life is wishing time away. In other words, wishing that this day would be done. Wishing these circumstances would be over. You know, God's given us the ability to, you know, have his Holy Spirit walk with us, live inside of us, guide us and direct us. And more times than not, we push all of those resources away and we settle for whatever we are able to do in and through our own power and strength. And then we wish our lives away when things start falling apart, rather than recognizing that we can see God in some of the most unbelievable, horrible circumstances. I mean, go all the way back, you know, from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, and you see all kinds of crazy things that happen, you know, in the Bible, horrible things that happen, and yet the people of God in the midst of those circumstances seem to find this unbelievable resolve that God is with me so I don't care. I mean, imagine being three young Hebrew boys finding yourselves in the midst of, of you know, complete chaos thrown into a furnace and there find Jesus with you. You know, think about Jesus himself having to go to the cross and all of his disciples you know, his friends and his family are standing back watching that, you know, in the horror that must have filled their hearts. And yet God was right in the midst of all of that. In fact, it was his purpose and his plan that was directing and guiding that. But when we find ourselves, you know, in the chaos that we've come out of in the last two years, we could be so overwhelmed by it that as the books get closed on 2021, all we can do is say, man, I'm so glad that's over with and have not received or, or really experienced the fullness of who God is in the midst of it. And I think that's a tragedy. I think that's a waste of life. God wants and expects us to take every moment that he gives us, you know, and not only look to see where he's at, but truly experience him in the midst of it all. We've made a declaration all last year and the year before that and I want you to hear these words again because we're going to make it every, every week this year. Think about these words that no matter what, no matter what it is that we're going through in our lives or what it is that we're coming out of, no matter what we're struggling with or what we've gotten victory over, no matter what is waiting around the next corner in our lives, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And that is to love God with all of our hearts, all of our soul, and all of our minds. And I'll be honest, that in and of itself is what has gotten me through the last couple of years. There's been days that I was so overwhelmed and so taken back by the ignorance and, and just the, the crazy things that have gone on in our nation, in our churches, our schools, in people's homes. And I can get so caught up in that that I lose sight of who I am and what God's called me to be and who he's called me to be. But the moment I start thinking to myself, man, I just need to focus. God, I know you're in this. I, I can't see the evidence, you know, right this moment, but I know you're here. I know you're with us, and I know you care for us. And every time that I've made God a priority, every time I have kept the main thing the main thing, God brings this peace and this resolve and he gives me the wisdom to lead his church, to lead his people, to get out in front and be who we've called to be. And I encourage you, as we stand on the threshold of this new year, that you resolve to do the same thing. That no matter what, keep the main thing the main thing. Amen? This is my 21st New Year's service that I've gotten to preach in this church. And it's interesting because I don't remember too many of them. There's surely some. 
I never probably connected it as well as I did this morning. But I thought about it this morning as I was looking at the calendar, kind of getting prepared to be here. And I thought, wait a minute, today is the eighth day after Christmas. Anybody know what that, what that represents, at least in the Bible? Eight days after Jesus was born, he was taken into the temple. And I want to read this to you. The Holy Spirit of God, first I want to tell you, the Holy Spirit of God had promised this old man that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. So this old man's been hanging out at the church like all of his life, just kind of waiting and waiting. And I'm certain that every child that came in, in his mind, he's thinking, I wonder if this is it. I wonder if this is the, if this is the child. I wonder if this is the Messiah only to maybe be disappointed time and time again. And as he got older and older and older, he must have been thinking, man, the clock's ticking, Lord. I don't know how much time I got left. But eight days after Jesus was born, God kept his promise to this man. I want you to hear it. It's in Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 28. The Bible says Simeon, he's the old man. Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and he praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. Verse 30 says, I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is the light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. As we prepare for this new year, as we begin our journey together, I want to tell you, I pray that all of you will experience Jesus in the very same way that Simeon did. With a full understanding, a full belief that he is the promised Messiah, that he is the light of divine revelation for all people. Because if you truly know him, you too will be filled with praises and a complete peace to live out your life on this earth. And when the time comes and you're ready to leave this, this planet and go to heaven, you're going to have so much confidence and you're going to be ready. But I also want to say that part of my prayer is if you haven't seen God's salvation with your own eyes, like Simeon did. I love that passage of scripture. Simeon says, I have seen your salvation. If you haven't seen God's salvation with your own eyes, like Simeon did, I pray that this year you will. Amen? I hope I'm here when I get to do this very same service eight days after Christmas. All right, most of you know we've already stepped through the, the doorway of 2022. And I wonder, has it crossed your mind what it's going to be like? I mean, do you kind of wonder what 2022 is going to be like? I mean, you look back at the last couple of years and there's not a lot of bragging rights there. I mean, have you begun to envision what it could be? And I'm not talking about based on where you came from, but based on where you're at right now with the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been dreaming about 2022 since October. In other words, I'm a visionary. I've already been thinking about, man, we can do this, and man, I think God can do that. And, you know, my mind just races all the time. It never stops. I'm constantly thinking about what if, what could be. Have you begun to wonder what it's going to be like? Well, I'll tell you, we can do one of two things with this new year, and it's completely up to you. We can waste it away if we want to. We can waste it away, and we can sit around and worry about all the things that we failed to accomplish or all the struggles and the mistakes that, you know, we've had to navigate our way through the last couple of years, or we can decide right now. Think about it. We can decide right now to make the most out of this new year. Because at the end of the day, it really is up to you. Next week, I'm beginning a new series titled Choices That Will Determine Your Future. 
And I really hope that you'll, you'll make a commitment to be here through this series because the truth is, what you do with this new year, at least in part, really will be determined by the choices that you make. I personally believe that this is going to be a great year for God's people. I believe it's going to be a great year for His church. I believe that God is going to open up the floodgates and pour out an amazing blessing on us all. Now let me tell you what that means. That means that in spite of what you understand, in spite of your circumstances, in spite of what you believe, in spite of what you may think, no matter what, 2022 could very well be the very greatest year of your life. Some of you may be thinking, what's the big deal? It's just another day on the calendar, right? In fact, the beginning of a new year could be described as just an imaginary line in the imaginary sands of time with no real manifestation of newness at all. I mean, there's no real new year look. There's no new year smell. I mean, there's nothing that really sets it apart from the last day of last year except you know, maybe the number on the calendar. But that's not to say that the beginning of a new year is insignificant at all. In fact, in Genesis 8.13, listen to this, the Bible says, by the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. Now, did you get that? It was the first day of the first month, you know, of the year. In other words, it was a New Year's Day that the human race got another shot. It was on New Year's Day that mankind got a new beginning. Now, I'd say that was pretty significant, wouldn't you? Well, listen, when the first Passover occurred in Egypt, when it was established as this perpetual ordinance in Israel, Notice what God said. This will, this will kind of blow your mind because it's kind of like he's cheating. He gets to do whatever he wants because he's God. But listen to this. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, from now on, starting today, from now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Now, I don't know what time of the year it was on their calendar or what we would recognize on our, our calendar. Just imagine it's in the middle of July and God says, okay, there's been enough, you know, crazy going on. We're going to push the reset button today. We're not going to wait until January. We're going to start right now. So it's July 3rd or July 4th or whenever, and it's going to now be January 1st. We're just going to start over because I'm God and I can do whatever I want to do. And that's exactly what happens. Listen, they would leave Egypt. They would be freed from their bondage, get a brand new start in life on a new New Year's Day. It was a new opportunity. It was a new beginning. And that was significant. You see, what makes a new year significant isn't the date on the calendar. It's the significance of the new beginning that we associate with it. So what's your new beginning going to be like this year? What new promises are you going to make? You know, what are your new commitments going to be? What new actions? You know, what new changes are you going to make in your life? Because most of us that are sitting here right now, we already know that resolutions, they're completely useless. Why? Because we usually, you know, lack the resolve to keep them. Last year was a tough year for a lot of people. I mean, it was a year of challenges. It was a year of choices. It was a year of changes. And for some of you, it was a real year of crisis. For some of you, the year 2021 was a whole lot more of a disappointment than it was a joy. But you know what the good news about this is? The bar has been so, or set so low in your life, it's not really going to take a lot, you know, for this year to be better for you, amen? Amen. I mean, listen, there's been so many challenges, so many changes, there's been enough crisis, there's been enough horrible circumstance, the bar has been set so low in your life that it's not going to take a lot for this year to be better for you. 
We all understand that God brings life to us in small pieces. We know it in hours and months and days. You know, listen, and nobody gets any more, any more time than anyone else. But here's the thing. At the beginning of every year, God says, let's wipe the slate clean. Let's begin a brand new year. God's saying that every January 1st, let's just start over. Proverbs 17, 24 says, An intelligent person aims at wise actions, but a fool starts off in many directions. The last part of that verse says, A fool starts off in many directions. I wonder, does that describe any of you this morning? I mean, have you already started off your year in a hurry? Are you already going in too many different directions with no real plan of action? Well, notice the words at the beginning of this verse. It says, an intelligent person aims at wise actions. That means they have a goal. They have an objective. They have an aim. They have a target. Have you set any goals for 2022? Or are you just kind of going to walk through this year and hope that it's better than last year? If you really want this year to be the best year of your life, if you really want to see God open the floodgates of heaven and pour out his blessing on us all, then you've got to prepare for that. This morning, I want to share with you some things that I believe will help us get the most out of 2022. And since... Some of you might have been up late last night or over the weekend. I'm going to use letters to kind of help you remember. So the first letter is the letter A, and it stands for accept. To get the most out of this year, you're going to have to accept responsibility for your own life. Accepting responsibility for your own life, I understand, is not a popular concept in our society today. Listen, we live in a culture of political correctness that basically says none of your problems are your fault. How many of you like that? That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? I mean, nothing that you do is your fault. Have you met those people? Have you talked to those people? Have you related to those people? Those people are miserable people because they accept no responsibility for their life. In other words, everything bad in your life is on somebody else. You can blame the environment. You can blame your teachers. You can blame your parents. Blame anybody because it's not your fault. If you get in an accident, it's not your fault. It doesn't matter that you're driving down the road texting and you're not paying attention because the other people around you, they ought to be paying attention, right? Nothing is your fault. And if you're that person that thinks it's somebody else's fault, you're probably also the person that thinks it's somebody else's job. You ever notice how many times you hear or say something like, it's not my job. Those words have come out of my mouth way too many times. You know, somebody will ask me to do something and I'm busy doing something else or I'm thinking about something else. And my first thought, hey, it's not my job. You walk into the bathroom, somebody left the water on, you walk out leaving it running and thinking, not my job. You see paper on the floor at work or paper on the floor at church and you walk by and think, wow, look at that. Somebody just left that there and you just keep on going. It's not my job. They pay janitors around here, don't they? I mean, somebody ought to be doing that. Somebody ought to be picking that mess up. Listen, we're never going to be a success in this life. You know, we're never going to make our lives count for anything if the attitude is that it's always somebody else's fault or it's always somebody else's job. We've got to accept responsibility for our own lives. Paul tells us in Galatians 6, 5 that each person must be responsible for himself. And the truth of that scripture is, I'm responsible for my own life, whether I like it or not. All of us, no matter what, all of us are going to face two kinds of circumstances this year, I promise you. First, there are going to be those circumstances that we have absolutely no control over. None of us here this morning have any way of knowing you know, all of what we're going to face this coming year. There are going to be certain things that are going to happen regardless of what you do, regardless of how well you plan. Things are just going to happen. Second, there are circumstances that we're going to face as a result of our own choices 
or our own actions or our lack of actions. But here's the thing. We may not be in control of all the circumstances that we face this year, but we do have control over how we act. We have control over how we respond to them. There's basically three kinds of people in life. There are the accusers, the excusers, and the choosers. And the accusers are the ones who always blame somebody else for their problems. They're the ones that are always, you know, talking about this is somebody else's job. Then there are the excusers. Excusers are the people that always have an excuse for never having to make a decision. You know, never having to do something. You know, there's always a reason why they can't make the most or get the most out of this life. You know, I discovered a long time ago that whenever I want to procrastinate about something, any excuse at all will do. In fact, the Bible says a lazy man is full of excuses. But then there's the choosers. They say that I choose to accept responsibility for my own life. They say I choose to understand that it's my job I accept responsibility for my goals. I accept responsibility for my happiness. I'm not dependent upon somebody else. I choose the direction of my life. I'm not dependent upon the crowd. Listen, if you want to get the most out of this year, then you need to be a chooser. And you need to accept responsibility for your own life. The next letter is the letter B. And it's very simply belief. If you really want to get the most out of this year, and if you want to be the best year ever in your life, you have got to believe that you can change. And that doesn't just mean change some habits. That means you may need to change your mind about some things. You may may need to change your attitude about some things. You may need to change the direction that you're going in. And you may have already decided in your heart that this is who you are, like it or not, and there's nothing that that you can do about it. I'm always going to be this way. Well, you've got to believe that you can change. You've got to stop saying, I can't, and start saying, I will. The person that believes they can change with the help of God will be changed. I'm sure that many of you have heard this verse, but I I want to share it with you today. Then I want to ask you a question. Philippians 4.13 says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How many of you have ever heard that? I thought so, because I've quoted it a hundred times. You know, my problem is 30 plus years of ministry, I've found very, very, very few people who actually believe this. Now, they'll say it, they'll encourage somebody else with it, They'll say, listen, you can do all things, especially that person that you're trying to encourage to get past maybe some of their habits or some of their hang-ups, the people that are struggling with their hurts. You say to them, listen, I'm telling you, you can do this. No, I can't. Yes, you can. No, I can't. Yes, you can. Listen, the Bible says I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You'll share that with somebody. You'll encourage you know, somebody. But you don't believe it yourself. You know how I know? Because I have so many people tell me, Pastor, I can't. I just heard you tell this person that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. I had someone that I was talking to this past week, and we were talking about that passage of Scripture that says, I know the plans that you have for me, plans to prosper me and not harm me, plans to give me hope in the future. And I've heard so many of you quote that, especially in times that, 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 that people are in crisis or, or people are really struggling people that are looking at their life and saying, I don't think it's going to get any better. No, pastor, I know the Bible says that that, that God has plans for us and and his plans not to harm us, it's to prosper us and to give us hope in the future. You say that and you encourage others with it, but you don't believe it. Because the moment you find yourself in a crisis, you resolve yourself to those circumstances and say, it's not going to get any better than this. I've got to accept life as it is. That's the biggest lie. At some point, I pray this year, that you open up the Word of God and you let it become alive to you. You open up the Word of God and you say, listen, God said it, I'm going to believe it. And I'm going to start living this way. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that God can do all things through Christ? Or is that just for somebody else? 
Because if you really believe that, that means there's nothing. Listen to me. There's nothing you're going to face in the next 363 days. No problem, no situation, no circumstance, no stress that you can't handle. Listen, there's nothing that's coming your way that you can't manage. There's nothing that you're not going to be competent enough to deal with because Christ who is in you will strengthen you. If you believe that. If you don't believe it, you'll start off with that hope, you'll start off with that thought, and then when you find yourself in the middle of it, maybe getting bound up, being prepared to throw, be thrown into that fire, then you start recanting, then you start thinking, well, you know what, he's allowed me to get bound up here, they're leading me towards this furnace, and I don't, I don't see anything stopping this. And sometimes you won't, folks until you're right in the middle of it. Then you look around, it's like, wasn't there just three of us in here? Who's this fourth guy who looks like a son of the God? You may not find that strength or that encouragement until you're right in the middle of it, and God lets you go all the way through that process, and then he reveals himself in the most critical time in your life. God wants us to trust his word. He wants us to trust him. And you've got to believe that God is who he says he is. A lot of people are never going to succeed in this life simply because they don't believe they can. They never enjoy life because life to them is just one big failure after another after another. They face a new year with regret rather than the joy of knowing that God has given them the opportunity to have the best year ever. They can't even get that thought wrapped around in their mind that this could be a good year. How? It's never been a good year for me. The last 15 years of my life has been horrible. With the help and grace of God, You need to believe that you can overcome your past. You can face your future. You have a new handle on life this coming year. You've got to believe and know that you'll change. You'll change your attitudes. You'll change your mind about who God is. Not with your power, but with the power that Christ gives you. Listen, the Bible is full of stories, and you know many of them, and it's easy to talk about them and not you know, really apply it to you. But the Bible's full of stories of people who changed because they believed that they could change after they had an encounter with God. Well, you tell me in the foyer, you tell me in counseling chambers, you tell me out on the streets that you had an encounter with God. Well, that encounter with God ought to be producing in you real change. There ought to be something about your life that says, I've read Philippians 4.13. I've got a plaque painted on my wall. It's in my car on the dash. I read it all the time. I just haven't really gotten to the point where I can believe. Remember when God called Moses and he said to him, I want to use you to save a nation. Remember what Moses said to him? Who, me? Me? You know I got kicked out of Egypt for killing the guy, right? And now I'm just out here, I'm just kind of feeding sheep. You know, I I don't talk well, I stutter, I'm slow of speech. I mean, you really want me to be the spokesman of a whole nation? God said, yeah, kind of crazy, isn't it? Yeah, I want to use you. God called out Gideon, remember him? When the nation of Israel was overrun by the enemy, God said to him, I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you, Gideon, to save the country. Gideon said, me, I'm the youngest kid in the poorest family in the smallest tribe of the nation. God said, yeah, I know. I know, but I'm going to use you. And your life, it's never going to be the same. You understand God wants to use you this morning as well? And you can stand up right now and you can say, yeah, God, but... Do you really know who I am? Do you know the mess I'm coming out of? you know the mess I'm in? you know what kind of things that I'm running from? What my past has held me hostage to? God says, yeah, I know all that. But I want to use you. And I want to change the world through you. All you have to do is believe that it's me speaking to you. All you have to believe is that I really do have a future for you. 
that I have plans to prosper you and not harm you. All you have to believe is that I really can do all things through you. Through Christ who strengthens you. All you got to do is believe. God wants to use you. But first you got to accept responsibility for your own life. And then you got to believe that you will change. you got to believe that God can give you the power to change if you'll trust Him. Next is the letter C, and it stands for clarify. If you want to make the most out of this year, if you want to be the best year ever, then you're going to need to clarify what you really want. Listen, you got to decide what's important and what's not. God's given each of us an incredible gift. We talked about it last week. It's called freedom. And we all have the choice to walk in that freedom. That's one of the things that really kind of makes us like God. When God said in Genesis chapter 1, let us make man in our own image, that gave us the freedom of choice. We have the freedom to choose between good and evil. We have the freedom to choose what we want in this life. The only way that we can clarify what is really important, I think, is to sit down and make a list. Make a list and then decide what's important and what's not. It's amazing to me how many people never stop and think through what's really important to them. They just get up and we're going to go out and work, we're going to get a job, we're going to have a family, and you know, we're going to do all these things, and you don't even know what's important to you. You've got to ask yourself, what's important to me? What really counts? Otherwise, you're going to get pushed around by the pressures of life, doing this and doing that, then all of a sudden the year's over with and you're asking, what the heck just happened? Where all this time go? You understand, you can't do what's really important until you clarify and know what's really important. Most people have this vague feeling, I just want to be happy. But you know what the problem with that is? They've never really sat down and tried to figure out what it's going to take to make them happy. I want to challenge you to make a list of things that are important to you, a list of things that you want to accomplish. Ask yourself, what do I really value? You know, what do I want to change? And then write it down on a piece of paper, and let me challenge you to do this this year. Make that your prayer list. You know, stick it on your, your, your mirror in the bathroom and look at it every day and pray about it. Ask God if those are the things that will honor Him. Listen, if the answer is no, let me encourage you folks, make a new list. Because trust me, anything you do outside of God's presence is not going to bring you happiness. You know, once you've made that list, you know, of things that you believe will please God, then make a plan of action, you know, that's going to help you accomplish those goals. Then do whatever you got to do to make and get the most out of this, this coming year. And then I want to challenge you to do this. Step back and watch God do miracles in your life. Listen, it is so amazing. I do this, you know, every single year. I do it several times, you know, a year. I'll make out a list of all the things that I really feel like I I want to accomplish, things I feel like God's inspiring me, and I start looking at these things. And you know what's so powerful about it? When you believe that God is at work, and you put that on your mirror somewhere, put it in the bathroom, because you're all going to the bathroom in the morning. So put it on the mirror in the bathroom, and as you're looking at yourself, look at those things. And what's going to be amazing is if you're truly trusting God, you're going to start seeing some of those things get checked off your list. And as they get checked off, it gives you that sense of confidence that God is at work. And you begin to see God do things in your life that you've never seen him do before. Because it's not random anymore. There's something so purposeful and intentional when you've written it down and you look at it and you realize, man, I've been praying about that, and that happened. You know, God did for me everything he said he would do. That's not going to happen, folks, in your life if you don't clarify. If you don't clarify what you really want. There's some things in life that we're going to do this year that are permissible, but trust me, they may not necessarily be to our advantage. In fact, there will probably be some things that all of us will do this year that's not going to be real good for us at all. There will be times when we're going to, to, to have to make a decision between what is good and what is better. 
between what's better and what's best. There's a lot of things that we can do, but not all of them are going to be beneficial. And you already know that we obviously don't have time for everything in our lives, so we need to clarify the two or three things that we've got to get done this year and then focus on them. You know, what are those things that are really important to you? What are those things that you know have to get done this year? If you don't really know, let me give you at least two or three things to consider. You know, I think, you know, what ought to be on the top of your list is your relationship with God. It ought to be number one. I mean, so think about that. What you might be able to do this year to strengthen and improve your relationship with God. If that's on your list and it's number one and you're looking at that every day, you walk in the bathroom, you're fixing that mess that you woke up to, you know, and you're starting to, to, to think about your day, look at that. It, it ought to be at the top of your list. I want to strengthen my relationship with God. And then ask yourself, what have I been doing to strengthen my relationship with God? Think about what you might be able to do to improve. What you can do to be more, you know, intimate with Him. You need to make your relationship with God your top priority. Your relationship with your family should be number two. You know, so what can you do to build a stronger and better relationship with your family? If that's on your mirror, you're looking at it every day, and you think, I haven't done anything with my family. It's been three weeks into the year, and I haven't even seen my children. I haven't talked to my wife. Then you know that I need, I need to put some effort into this. I need to work. Number three, you know, ought to be your relationship with your church family. You know, so what can you do to improve the quality of your church? And when you look around here, you walking by the garbage in the foyer, thinking that's somebody else's job, or are you the one that walked out of the bathroom because I walked in after you and the water was still running. And my first thought was, well, guy must have not thought that was his job, so it's mine. What can you do to make your church better? You know, what can you do to help accomplish the vision that God's called us to? How committed can you become, you know, in your attendance and your support? Let me tell you a real fact about these three things. These are the three things that I have heard people on their deathbed wish to God that they had given, you know, greater priority to. Truth is, folks, I've never heard anybody in all of my years of ministry ever say to me on their deathbed, man, I wish I'd have spent a little bit more time at the office. Man, I wished I could have worked just a few more years. I wished I could have spent more time building my career or, or fishing or golfing or playing games. Never heard anything like that. You need to clarify what's important. Take a hard look at your life this morning. And then finally, and this may be the most important of all, and that is the letter D. And it stands for don't wait. If you want to make the most out of this year, if you want this to be the best year ever, then don't wait to get started. Do it right now. You know, get started this morning. These three words, you know, do it now, it could absolutely change your life. If you wait, you know, for the right situation or the right kind of circumstances, I'm promising you right now, you are going to absolutely miss out on life altogether. There's never going to be an ideal set of circumstances to get started with almost anything. To make the most out of 2022 and accomplish the things that you want to accomplish, you got to get started and you got to do it now. So start this morning. You know, don't wait to begin. Ecclesiastes 11.4 says, if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. Man, I was a master at this. Every time I decide I'm going to lose some weight, you know what I always say? Man, tomorrow morning, I'm going to hit it. But tonight, I'm going to eat everything in the house. You ever know? I mean, we all do that, right? That's exactly what we do. We'll do this tomorrow. We're going to get started tomorrow. No, listen, if you're going to do it, you need to get started today. You need to get started today, and I'm going to tell you why. We don't always, you know, uh, we don't always have the same kind of courage, the same kind of confidence, you know, once we walk out those doors as we do right now. I mean, don't we always say things like when things settle down or when things get better, I'll do this or I'll do that? The problem is we all know that things never settle down. Things don't always get better because that's life. If you're using that as an excuse and you're saying to God, when things settle down or get better, 
man, God, I'm going to start having a quiet time with you, Lord. I'm going I'm to have a prayer time with you. Listen, don't lie to yourself. You're never going to do that. You need to learn to read your Bible and have that prayer time when things are unsettled, when things aren't so good. I've heard people say when things settle down, I'm going to spend more time with my kids. Listen, if you wait that long, you know what's going to happen? They're going to be grown and gone. Trust me, as a father, I know, and sadly, I know that from experience. There's a lot of people that have missed out on life waiting for the ideal set of circumstance or waiting for things to get better. And you know what? While they were waiting, it's a funny thing, time just kept right on going. Time didn't say, oh, wait, Pastor Randy's got some things to do. We need to just stop for a little bit and let him catch up with us. Time just keeps on going. We've got to learn to enjoy life under circumstances that are less than perfect. Whatever you're going to do, whatever it is that you want to do, get started. Because things may never settle down. Things may never get any better. But if you get started now, in spite of your circumstances, you can still have the best year ever. Amen? Some of you are saying to yourself right now, man, I'm going to do this. I mean, Pastor Randy's encouraged me. He's had some passion. I'm going to make the most out of this year, man. I'm going to set some goals. I'm going to do everything I can through the power of Christ to accomplish them. You're feeling really good right now, but let me tell you something. Right now, you're being motivated. You're being challenged to make the most out of this year. But when you walk out that door, truth is, and you know it, there may not be anybody out there to motivate you. There may not be a single person to encourage you to be any more than you are right now. In fact, you may find yourself surrounded by people that call you a fool. You're going to trust God seriously. Okay, well, let me know how that works out. I'll be here when that doesn't work. So you've got to determine right now. There ain't nobody out there that's going to encourage you or build you up or, or be there you know, when things get rough to, to, to kind of remind you of all the things God wants to do. So you've got to determine right now that it doesn't matter what happens or what comes your way, that this is going to be the best year you've ever had. As I close this morning, I want to share a story with you from John Maxwell's book, Developing the Leader Within. He says, a Middle Eastern mystic said, I was a revolutionary when I was young, and all my prayers to God was simply, Lord, give me the energy to change the world. As I approached middle age and realized that my life was half gone without changing a single soul, I changed my prayer to, Lord, give me the grace to change all those who come into contact with me, just my family and friends, and I shall be satisfied. Now that I'm an old man and my days are numbered, I have begun to see how foolish I've been. My one prayer now is, Lord, give me the grace to change myself. If I had prayed this prayer right from the start, I would not have wasted my life. What kind of person will you be this year? Will you be an accuser, an excuser, or a chooser? Will you choose to make right now the most out of 2022? Will you accept the responsibility for your own life? Will you believe that you can change, change your attitude, change your direction, change your mind? Will you clarify, you know, what you want this year and what's important to you? And will you do it now? Will you make the decision before you leave that, God, I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it now? Will your relationship with God be on the top of your priority list? Will your family and your church be at the top of that list? Well, the gospel is the choice is yours. So what will it be? Stand with me as we pray. God, I thank you so much for this new year. And I know that the significance in this new year is that you have given it to us. You've challenged us to wipe the slate clean, to begin fresh and new, to look with op optimism, God, on a future that you have planned for us, a future that you have planned to prosper us and not harm us, to give us hope. 
God, I ask you right now in the name of Jesus Christ for those that are here, Lord, that have been blaming people for their lives for far too long, that today would be the day that they accept responsibility for their lives. God, I pray for those that believe for everybody else but not for themselves. They believe that you can give me strength, but they don't believe it for themselves. God, I pray for those who haven't been able to clarify, maybe in years, what's really important to them. God, I pray for all of those people today, all of us as we stand in your church. God, that we will trust you and we'll do it now. We'll do it today. God, I pray that we would come together as a body of believers encouraging one another. Lord, that we would look around and we would see all the hope that you have filled us with and that we would be a light and an example to those around us. God, let us go into this year having closed the books on 2021 with the idea that everything before us, Lord, is where you've already been. You've not only been at the beginning of 2022, you're already standing at the end. And you know everything that's going to be required of us to have the very best year. So I pray that we open our eyes to see that truth in you and that we surrender ourselves to you, I pray in Christ's name. I'm going to ask you with your heads bowed and your eyes closed as our counselors come. Maybe there are some of you that really want to be bold and courageous this morning and you just want to step out and come down and pray with one of these counselors and just say to God, Lord, I trust you and I want this to be the best year of my life. Do in me, God, whatever needs to be done. Help me to make whatever choices that I need to make to find myself surrendered to you completely. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, You've never seen, as Simeon did, your salvation. I want to encourage you to step out and come forward and let one of these counselors pray with you, help you understand what it means to be born again, to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. As God gives you this opportunity on this first Sunday of 2022, would you come?